Welcome to South Florida Geriatric Workforce Education Program, and the topic today is opioid use in the elderly. My name is Drujan Kaja, and welcome. The learning objectives for this program are understanding the management of chronic pain, the scope of the opioid epidemic, unique challenges faced by elderly patients, changing regulatory and prescribing guidelines for opioid use. The rate of opioid analgesic use in the last 30 days was around 7.9% in those aged greater than 60 years compared to 47 for those between ages 20 and 39. That is, in, in this particular survey that we're referencing, at least 7.9% of people in the past 30 days had admitted to the use of opioids. Those aged 65 and older were 25.4% of long-term users of opioids. And one in three Medicare Part D beneficiaries who received, received an opioid medication in 2017. Data from 2002 to 2014 National Survey on Drug Use and Health showed that medical opioid present prescription drug use during the past 12 months doubled among those aged 65 and over. Medicare beneficiaries have amongst the highest use and fastest growing rates of diagnosed opioid use disorder at more than six of every thousand beneficiaries. Nationally, one third of Medicare Part D beneficiaries, or 14.4 million people, had at least one opioid prescription in 2016, with over half a million beneficiaries using very high amounts of the medication. These patterns vary by state. Alabama and Mississippi have the highest proportion of Part D beneficiaries with at least one opioid prescription, and 46 and 45% respectively. Causes of long-term opioid use and abuse in the elderly. Prescription opioids for chronic pain, erosion of social loss and loss of loved ones, pain, pain post-procedure, and accumulated traumatic experiences. And for the purpose of this presentation, long-term opioid therapy is defined as opioid use on most days for duration greater than three months. And with that, we want to get into kind of a classification uh, of opioids. Mainly, this one focuses on how, the, whether they're naturally occurring, semi-synthetic, or synthetic. Now, naturally occurring ones include morphine, codeine, and pepeverine. And morphine is one of the most commonly abused street opioids, whereas synthetic opioids include pethidine, fentanyl, and so on. Calculation of total daily dose. One of the important things that physicians need to do is to calculate between different opioid classes based on what's called their MME. The, and the conversion is provided in this uh, in the following chart. The morphine milligram equivalents of different opioids are compared against each other and the dose equivalents are listed. Chronic pain management in the elderly. One of the important things to address in the elderly in terms of opioid abuse is that there are legitimate reasons for the opioid prescriptions there. And one of those is chronic pain management. Understanding how chronic pain management works is very important to understanding opioid use disorder. The CDC and others have reviewed the available evidence for the efficacy of opioid use and found that opioids are moderately, only moderately effective for pain relief for periods of three months or less, but generally not for long-term use. Evidence shows that effective chronic pain management may involve step therapy. Step therapy is a patient-centered approach involving potentially more than one technique. Techniques which could be part of step therapy include cognitive behavioral therapy, physical rehabilitation, pharmacologic or interventional therapies. Alternative medications for chronic pain management include NSAIDs, antidepressants, anti-epileptics, and capsaicin-based creams and patches. Self-management therapy. The concept is to help the individual manage the consequences and the lifestyle changes associated with a painful chronic condition. Coping with these conditions includes accepting the presence of painful conditions, exercise, relation, relaxation, and other techniques to improve function. The chronic pain management self-management program was effective in reducing pain in two randomized clinical trials. Participants in the program experienced significant improvements in pain, dependency, vitality, aspects of role functioning, life satisfaction, and self-efficacy and resourcefulness. 
Some aging network partners offer this program. Let's go over the CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. The CDC in its 2016 guidance developed five key questions and the answers to those questions inform their recommendations. Question number one, the effectiveness and comparative effectiveness of opioid use, harms and adverse events, dosing strategies, risk assessment and risk mitigation strategies, and finally, the effect of opioid therapy for acute pain on long-term use. Point one effectiveness and comparative effectiveness <laughs> quote no study of opioid therapy versus placebo no opioid therapy or non-opioid therapy for chronic pain evaluated long-term outcomes related to pain function or quality of life most placebo controlled randomized clinical trials were, were six weeks or shorter in duration from an evidence-based medicine point of view this shows that making any judgment on the basis of studies for opioid use greater than six weeks in duration is not supported. Harms and adverse events. Long-term opioid therapy was associated with problematic patterns of opioid use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress. Long-term opioid therapy was associated with an increased risk of opioid abuse or dependence diagnosis. Opioid use was associated with a dose-dependent increase risk of fatal and non-fatal overdose. Other risks associated with opioid use included cardiovascular events, endocrinologic harms, and road trauma. Slide 17. Risk assessment and risk mitigation strategies. Evidence on the accuracy of risk assessment instruments for predicting opioid misuse or abuse was inconsistent for the opioid risk tool and limited for other risk assessment instruments. No study has evaluated the effectiveness of risk mitigation strategies. Dosing strategies. Initiation of therapy with an extended release slash long acting opioid was associated with greater risk of non-fatal overdose than initiation with an immediate release uh, opioid in one study. Three studies of various extended release and long-acting opioids found no clear differences related to pain or function. Effect of opioid therapy for acute pain on long-term use. Studies examining patients who underwent low-risk surgery or experienced low back pain from injury revealed that opioid therapy prescribed for acute pain was associated with greater likelihood of long-term use. Compared with no early opioid use for low, acute low back pain, the adjusted odds ratio for receiving five or more opioid prescriptions from 30 to 730 days after onset was 2.08. And finally, let's go over the recommendations, determining, which include determining when to initiate or continue opioids for chronic pain, opioid selection, dosage, duration, follow-up, discontinuation, and assessing the risk and addressing the harms of opioid use. Determining when to initiate or continue opioids for chronic pain. Non-pharmacologic therapy and non-opioid pharmacologic therapy are preferred for chronic pain. Clinicians should consider opioid therapy only if the expected benefits for both pain and function are anticipated to outweigh the risks. Before starting and periodically during opioid therapy, clinicians should discuss with patients known risks and realistic benefits of opioid therapy and patient and clinician responsibilities for managing therapy. Before starting opioid therapy for chronic pain, clinicians should also establish treatment goals with all patients, including realistic goals for pain and, fu pain and function, and should consider how therapy will be discontinued if the benefits do not outweigh the risks. Opioid selection, dosage, duration, follow-up, and discontinuation. When starting opioid therapy for chronic pain, clinicians should prescribe immediate release opioids instead of extended release. When opioids are started, clinicians should prescribe the lowest effective dosage, and clinicians should use caution when prescribing opioids at any dosage. Should carefully reassess evidence of individual benefits and risks with increasing dosage, to 15 morphine milligram equivalents or more per day and should avoid increasing dosage to 90 mil morphine milligram equivalents or more. Long-term opioid 
of use often begins with treatment of acute pain. When opioids are used for acute pain, clinicians should prescribe the lowest effective dose of immediate release. Clinicians should evaluate benefits and harms of patients within one to four weeks of starting opioid therapy for chronic pain or of dose escalation. Clinicians should evaluate benefits and harms of continued therapy with patients every three months thereafter or more frequently. If benefits do not weigh har outweigh harms of continued op opioid therapy, clinicians should optimize the therapies and work with opioids to lower dosages. Assessing the risks and addressing the harms. Before starting per and periodically during continuation of opioid, of opioid therapy, clinicians should evaluate risk factors for opioid-related harms. Clinicians should incorporate into management plan strategies to mitigate risk, including and considering offering naloxone when factors that increase risk for opioid risks, such as history of overdose, history of substance use disorder, history of opioid dosages greater than 50 mil morphine milligram equivalents. Clinicians should also review the patient's history of controlled substance prescriptions using a state prescription drug monitoring program. When prescribing opioids for chronic pain, clinicians should use urine drug testing before starting opioid therapy and should consider urine drug testing at least annually to assess for prescribed medications as well as other controlled prescription drugs and illicit drugs. And clinicians should also avoid prescribing opioid pain meds and benzodiazepines concurrently whenever possible. Further considerations for opioid use in the elderly patients. Patients older than 65 years that might have reduced renal function, even in the absence of renal disease, it is important to monitor GFR and creatinine clearance in these patients. Patients must also be monitored for reduced hepatic function, safe prescribing practices, indicate a starting dose of 25 to 50% recommended adult starting dose before titrating up slowly in patients greater than 75 years of age. Opioid recommendations in renal hepatic insufficiency. Opioid recommendations for in renal insufficiency include medications such as fentanyl and methadone and the tables given in this chart can provide further information regarding this. Things to discuss with patients regarding opioid use. We can discuss things including side effects such as constipation, dry mouth, nausea and vomiting, drowsiness, confusion, the growth of tolerance, and physical dependence. Other considerations should include potential for drug diversion, reduced cognitive function, risks of concomitant, and risks of concomitant alcohol use. Opioid use disorder, the screen. All patients receiving medical evaluation for endocarditis, bacteremia, skin, skin abscesses, vertebral osteomyelitis, HIV infection, or hep C virus infection should be screened for opioid use disorder. Patients with history of chronic long-term use of opioids and screening instruments with good spe sensitivity and specificity include the rapid opioid screening tool for opioid dependence, OWLS, which is a four-item self-administered screening tool, the rapid opioid dependence screen was developed with the criteria from the DSM-4. It has a high sensitivity and specificity. Although based on di diagnostic criteria from DSM-4 rather than DSM-5, the instrument can still be used full for a clinician who to follow up. The items in the inventory are detailed here. DSM-5 Diagnostic Criteria for Opioid Use Disorder. These criteria should properly be referred from a DSM manual, but this is just for your quick viewing and reminder. Medicare-based support for opioid use disorder. Medicare and combined Medicare-Medicaid reimbursement for opioid use disorder has undergone a sea change in the past few years and is continuing to change rapidly. As such, the resources in this document will refer to FY 2020 and FY financial year 2021 updates. There are two major mechanisms by which CMS organizes opioid use disorder reimbursements, and these are based on the setting of patient and opioid treatment programs. For office-based billing, opioid use disorder reimbursements for overall management, care coordination, group and individual psychotherapy, substance counseling, and various add-on codes are available. Please refer to the, the CY2020 physician fee schedule.
SBIRT services and reimbursements for screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, as well as screening tools available through the SAM SAMHSA website. Let's, let's briefly review the Support Act. The bundled provision of funds for opioid use disorder therapy at CMS, reimbursement is per week of the program, expands and codifies Medicare reimbursements for treatment of opioid use disorder. It was signed into law in October 2018, expanding the use of telehealth services beyond rural and underserved areas, and screening for SUDs effective January 2020. Available resources for patients include the National Aging Network, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you.